Am I Reister or am I wrong? And of course, with my main man, Ralph Amston. Okay, so I got your feedback from a couple of people who talked to me about the podcast. They were like, yo, I love Ralph's addition to the podcast, adds so much value, but who the hell is Ralph Amston? So uh, I like to describe Ralph as a, he's the resident historian. You know, like if it comes to like numbers, facts, um, he is a Twitter profile. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you call him? Twitter troll investigator? I guess, I guess. Like, yeah, if, uh, there's a pretty good chance if you got an anonymous account out there that's just, uh, trolling people just to troll, there's a pretty good chance I can figure out who it is. Um, not, not, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not shooting a hundred percent on this, but over the last 12 years, I've found like people who were just, just like getting all over media, talking about their families, talking about their wives. I found, found them to be like cardiologists. I've found them to be all, all lawyers, all sorts of people, just because people aren't as good at, you know, they the always like county. Follow, yeah, a high school principal one time. That was pretty funny. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't say that that's that. I hope that's not what I'm known for. But I, from time to time, if it gets bad enough, I'll dig into it and I'll I'll just use somebody's first name just to let them know that I know. Yeah. So he's Twitter burner account finder, resident historian, um, all around smart guy, uh, plant grower. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> Uh, I don't yeah. want people to interpret no, that no, incorrectly. Not, not, not marijuana plant grower, but you know he's, you know, growing his own vegetables and harvesting them and uh, <laughs> peppers and all of that kind of kind of stuff as well. He's got more of a green thumb than I do because I tend to kill to kill things. Um, but <laughs> on today's episode, though, Coach Shashevsky, Mike Shashevsky at Duke. He makes a comment after, in a post-game interview, the world loses their mind. President Joe Biden, he wore a Rolex, and the media overreacts even more than they did to Obama's tan suit. The Tiger Woods documentary on HBO is unbelievably riveting, and it gives us insight into Tiger Woods that we would have never thought. And Dr. Bricks and Dr. Fauci, well, actually, Dr. Bricks is trying to save her reputation, but is it too little too late? And Dr. Fauci talks about what it's like to work in the White House. These people seem traumatized. And Tom Brady is more responsible for the Patriots dynasty than Bill <laughs> Belichick. Yes, I said it. Um, am I right or am I wrong? Is the intersection where sports, business, society and pop culture meet the truth? The truth is the most important thing that we have. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, fire. Facts only. Check your feelings at the door before you even show up because no BS is allowed. We keep it 100. And if you can shoot us an email, I'm at I M M A D at unafraidshow.com. Make sure that you subscribe, tell a friend about it, and you can subscribe and listen to us on the Pac 12 Apostles podcast. Me on Mad Dog Sports Radio, Monday through Friday, 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern Time, and Sundays, 2 to 5 p.m. Um, so, Ralph, what what were you just saying when we just started? Okay, so if I look tired, it's not because I was crying because of the end of the <laughs> Buffalo Bills season. Uh, I, got, I got a little bit of a road trip this week, so I've been... Yeah, but tell uh, people why. Trying to- Tell tell people why you would have been crying at the end because they need to get to know you. Uh, okay, so I'm from I'm from Wyoming, right? Uh, lo- I love love an underdog story. I'm from Wyoming. Josh Allen's from Wyoming. I've been a big fan of his since 2016, so about four and a half years now. Um, I I I've, I've known George. I've known you for over two years. I push back on all the stuff you said about Josh Allen being a tight whoa, end. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm the person back. who told you I Oh, you're right. I'm no, all I learned in about him Josh from you. Allen. Yeah, I learned I, you're right. Okay. <laughs> historian, historian. I learned about Josh Allen from you. 
you sold me on them. I bought in hard and now I'm just there just doubling down, investing, investing. And so uh, I'm, I'm a big Josh Allen fan <laughs> and have been for a very long time. And so for him to get to the point that he's got to in the last three years, um, I had to kind of prepare, prepare my heart going into the day because I knew the chiefs are going to win. Patrick Mahomes is, is head and shoulders above pretty much any quarterback in the NFL, much less Josh Allen. So I'm not taking this personal. I'm not trying to put him on that level. I'm a super fan, but I'm not an idiot. Right. So the, the chiefs are really well constructed. Um, they're really well coached. I did not expect the bills to compete today, but what I know from a lifetime of following sports is when you got a bunch of sports reporters with nothing else to do, and you go from covering 32 teams down to four, all of that opinion energy, uh, convalesces on whoever's left. So you could have a quarterback throw four touchdowns and run for another one. And then the other quarterback throw five touchdowns and the national narrative will be, what's wrong with the quarterback that threw four touchdowns. So I'm used to that. I've been, I've been witnessing it my entire life. And I said, going into today, I know the bills are going to lose. And I know that the national opinion machine is going to, uh, it's going to be a rite of passage for Josh Allen to get torn apart because Aaron well, Rodgers was getting torn apart too. Aaron yeah, Rodgers but, was getting torn apart too. But and so I said to myself, because, no, don't on. take it personally because okay. I've been taking it. I've been making it my business to take it personal because I knew he'd be good. I've been making it my business for three years to take all this personally. <laughs> and now today I said, all right, when they lose, he will have earned everybody trashing him because he gets to be in the room where it happens. He gets to be in the conversation and, and I'm, I'm fine with it. And then I remembered that there are a couple people out there that you would never do this. You would never do this. But there are a couple of people out there that are very invested in Josh Allen's failure, one of them being Nick Wright. And I had to try really hard not to click on his time. Like, I wanted to be mad. I wanted to be upset. I wanted to argue with him. <laughs> I wanted to send him mean tweets. But I knew if I, I knew that if I even clicked on his profile, so please don't read me any, don't tag me in any of his tweets. Don't read me anything that he said. I don't want to know because I just, uh, I'm just You happy. already know it's going to happen uh, now, dude. You, you just literally asked for it. So I just, I'm just happy that Nick Wright is talking about Josh Allen in almost February. Okay. Cause next year it might be in February. Okay. Here know. is the, here is the problem is that, I was not in on Josh Allen. I've been made, made it clear. I thought it was going to be a bum, like not even because he was inaccurate in high school, in college, whatever Brian Dable and the and Sean McDermott have done. This has been nothing short of a miracle. Like this is turning water into wine. Um, what has happened to Josh, Josh Allen's career. So, right. but it was absurd when I read an article yesterday saying, that Josh, that move over Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen is just as good. I was like, what? <laughs> Man, if you don't slow down. And I called Ralph in the third quarter today, uh, well, in the third quarter of the game, and I was like, Ralph, are you okay? I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> it was in the middle of a 38-6 to six Chiefs run. And I was ah. like, I was doing that thing. <laughs> I was doing that thing where you sit on the couch where your back's where your butt's supposed to be. And I'm you just like, slid all the way down the couch. Yeah. <laughs> With every Ooh. touch, you know, I was just dropping a few <laughs> hey, did, hey, did your kids know not to come in there and bother you? They, uh, a couple of times they came in and they'd start to say like, oh, who's winning? And then they, they'd see the score and they'd just turn around and walk. <laughs> They were like, yo, do not do it. They probably were in there talking to each other. Listen, don't do anything bad today because dad is going to lose it if you do. One of my sons, my oldest son, who's not not really into sports all that much, is a super brainiac. He kept on me like, but aren't the Chiefs like really good? And I'm like, yeah, man, they're they're the best. And he'd be like, OK, so why are, are you, you mad? We have like what this is. And I was like, I'm not. I knew. I'm not. Just go away. I'm not. <laughs> and if you, but he's like, you're clearly right, mad, Dad. If you want me to continue to not be mad, you'll shut up and you'll leave yeah. the room. Okay. Well, there's another man who was not mad, but clearly a little bit frustrated after a basketball game, and that's Coach Mike Krzyzewski. And this post-game interview made people lose their mind. I couldn't even figure out why people were upset. Here's the video. In the audio. 
Hi, Coach. I'm just curious as to what, what the next step forward here is for the team as you guys move into another week of basketball. Yeah, why don't we just evaluate this game? You know, I'm not into what our next step forward is right now. We just finished the hard fought game. Yeah, I don't know if, like, when you, what, what, what's your major? What's your major at Duke? What's your hardest class? Econ. Okay. So say you just had the toughest econ test in the world. And when you walked out, somebody asked you, what's your next step? Uh, you see what I mean? Does that, you have some empathy and, and you know, just give us time to evaluate this game and then we'll, we'll figure out just like we always try to do. Okay, so this was after Duke fell to five and five. They lost to Louisville, and it was a hard-fought game. And I cannot, for the life of me, figure out why people are upset, Ralph. I was like, okay, that people sometimes forget that even though you are – that coaches and players are in the entertainment business – Sometimes they forget that they're still human beings and after stuff is tough and or a long season, you could have had a fight with your wife, anything. Sometimes you just don't want to hear that BS, man. Sometimes you just want to be like, yo, stop. Like, I don't know what the next step is right right now. The, we're not we're not going there. I don't like people were equating him to Bobby Knight. Like the dude didn't throw a chair. He asked the kid like a reasonable question. He was like, what's your mate? The way he could give him a proper analogy. He wasn't undressing the kid. I just, I just hated the overreaction. And why do we have to overreact to every damn thing? I don't know. I, the, every single person I saw that called him a jerk or a tyrant or an a-hole, I was just like, how nice were your parents to you? Because that one of two things is going on here. One, you're projecting, yeah. right? You, you are projecting feelings that you already had and intent that you already had on the Mike Shashevsky for whatever reason. The other thing is you were very much coddled or or your parents didn't like you enough to give you the why behind the what. Because that's that's the whole thing that we were taught about young millennials and Zoomers is that you can't just tell them to do something. You also have to give them the why behind the what. So what Coach K was saying is like, I don't know, man. I'm in my feelings right now. And I want to illustrate to you a situation in which you might be in your feelings so that you can understand why the question you're asking me stings a little bit right now. And that's all I heard. Yep. Ralph, I, I just couldn't understand. I 100% agree with you. I was like, he didn't even say any damn thing. Like, if, if that is the thing that you find offensive, then, then you are S-O-F capital T. If that's the thing that you find offensive, there is no chance that you could make it in, an, in even a high school locker room, let alone a college locker room or even a pro locker room. You might as well forget about it. You would be going home like you would cry when you got in the car if you found that offensive. And if that's the worst thing that a journalist is going to have said to him, like imagine him trying to... Um, like be a journalist in sports and having to go interview Greg Popovich or, or Bill Belichick. I mean, dude, like that wasn't even bad. Also, that's what you want. You want human emotion. That gives you the thing to write out. You should be thanking him. Yep. You should be thanking him. He created a story out of something that w was a throwaway thing. That who cares? Who cares what the next? No one would have ever been talking about what they're going to do next. Instead, he tries to impart a lesson to a student journalist in a way that the two of them don't connect. And it gives us all something to dissect and, and to talk about. Like, that's what you want as a journalist. You want, you want emotion. You don't want somebody to be a robot. It is absolutely absurd that there was this pile on and I don't know what it is, man. I, to be honest, I hear, hey, we need to be able to stay on our parents' insurance till we're 26. And I keep hearing more and more, like, you're not an adult until what age? 
Until what age? At what point does a, a 21 through 23 year old student reporter become somebody who can hear the words, do you understand why I don't like the question you ask me? Exactly, dude. Because oh, that's the lowest a, of low end of aggression. Yes, dude. It. I, we just have to toughen up, dude. We we have to toughen up. And they were projecting on Mike Shashevsky because they don't like him. I don't get it, man. But um, speaking of projecting, though, there is a scandal going on in America, people. There is another scandal going on in America. I mean, a scandal even worse. A scandal even worse than this. This was one of the biggest scandals in American history. President Obama wore a tan suit. Everybody lost their minds in conservative, quote unquote, conservative media. They lost their mind. And I say conservative media in quotes because they just, because uh, they have hijacked what actual conservatives like me are like they have hijacked it. And now apparently I'm a liberal apparently now. So they went crazy over a tan suit, but now they're going, they say, Oh, it's not presidential. This isn't what you're supposed to wear. How could he, if I were president Obama, I would have worn the damn tan suit again. But here is the, the new scandal. Joe Biden wore a Rolex. Oh my God. Oh my God. He wore a Ralph. Can you believe he wore a Rolex at the inauguration? How dare he start the impeachment process? <laughs> I was more confused because it was in, it was in the New York times, this thing, this commentary about his decision to wear a Rolex, but it was like in the fashion section. So I guess they were just looking for some type of angle, but it was the way the article was written that put it on the level of like, we're making something out of nothing. It was saying that Joe Biden, who you've seen in the past in aviators is out there in a $6,000 Rolex for the sole reason that even in the day and age of like gender fluidity and sensitivity to women and the elevation of minority voices, that at the end of the day, he still wants to be seen as a top gun, tough guy. And in reading this thing, I learned, I was like, do people think Rolexes are hard? Like, do people think Rolexes are, are manly? I don't, I, I have no context for this. I don't really know a lot of people in my daily life who wear a, who wear a Rolex. I don't, is there imagery there? That's like, you're a, you're a man's man, scotch and a cigar. No, no, dude. The, the, when, when I think of a Rolex, right. I do not think of, Ooh, Ooh, Ooh. I feel more manly now. No, nah, I'm like, yo, it's a nice watch. Okay. In all transparency, I own a Rolex. Okay. <laughs> and, and, but when I put it on, I'm not like, Ooh, 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 I feel like smoking a Marlboro, riding, putting on a cowboy hat and going to go, you know, fight crime or something. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, all right. I, I'll tell you what my connotation of a Rolex is. Okay. Um, old. People of a certain age, and I know, I know you're <laughs> what are you doing with me. I got, I, got, I got my Fitbit, right? So we're yeah. good here, but... I also have, I'm Ralph the fourth. I have Ralph the first's timepiece hanging above my bed. I remember from all this old timey stuff that I read and the gift of the Magi and other stories like that. A timepiece used to be a really important thing. A watch yep. used to be a really important accessory. It was a thing that you could take care of that. Like there were it watch repairers and watchmakers. You would hand them down over time. Like I have a fourth generation timepiece I don't have a timepiece. I have my great grandfather's timepiece, right? So when I see an old man in a Rolex, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. See, <laughs> so I no offense. Dude, look, I it is an older man's watch, but here's the thing that's happened in fashion. What what has happened is when I was younger, I had a watch, uh, a um, I've owned like a Benny and Company watch. I've had a De, De Beers watch, a De Beers watch, where it was 
the entire watch was diamonds the entire way around the face all that and people people would sometimes ask me like how can you tell t time on this thing i'm like uh i don't care about telling time it's supposed to shine <laughs> and so but as you get older and you understand the value of jewelry value of money all of these things and you're like okay if i'm going to spend money on a watch or because a lot of this jewelry that you see people buying, especially when it's super flashy and all that, it's not necessarily um, as it, it may be quality jewelry some, sometimes, but it has no resale value. So if you either buy your uh, chains or what whatever in real gold, like 18 karat or 24 karat gold, then it's going to be way more expensive. But then you can go sell it at some, some point in time at the spot price of of gold so you won't lose money on it and the same thing if you buy a rolex so if you buy a rolex for for like thirteen thousand dollars i mean they go all the way down to like five but five on the way up plus right so you're gonna be if you don't alter the watch then it's going to be it's going to be worth more in a few years provided that you take care of it but the whole point is why was this a scandal and this was a big deal because Ralph learned today that presidential watches are a thing. He did not know this. So what did you learn today, Ralph? So, yeah, I, I had no idea. I remember I remember hearing something um, in college about JFK getting a watch from Marilyn Monroe. But I didn't know that there was this whole like economy dedicated to tracking the watches of presidents throughout history. And so you told me to pull up some of the watches of presidents throughout history. And we saw some nonsense. I, there was like a Warren Harding Masonic watch. Here it is. I, Here it is. There it is right there. <laughs> That's a scandal. In like today's day and age where there's like a huge uh, uh, grip of people out there that believe that uh, the – politicians that rule the country are part of some secret baby eating cult. If I saw a president had a watch like this, I might believe that this is the cultiest watch I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, dude, th that's a commitment. It's a secret society. It's a secret, non-secret society. Right. Yes. You're not keeping it a secret. If you have that watch. Correct. <laughs> yeah. But there's no, the, the problem is that you don't know what what's in it. So imagine if a president, was actually made it known that he was part of Skull and Bones or the the a Freemason or whatever other secret society that there is. Imagine the amount of conspiracy theories that there would be. There would be no limit, especially do the the QAnon people would take that and he would be. I don't even know where they would take it. I think I have I I grew up around people who who would always say like, you got to watch out for Freemasons. I've never met a Freemason in my entire life. And then mm, I, and no, then, you, I guarantee you have met a Freemason. You just didn't know that they were a Freemason. Okay. And then, so I found out, uh, cause there ended up being this uh, Masonic lodge, uh, next to the high school that I went to. And then there was another one in, uh, uh, the town I was born in up in Northern Wyoming. And what I learned really quickly about Masonic lodges is they're not that much different than, other types of lodges where it really seemed like it's a bunch of dudes looking for literally any reason to, to get, get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. It well, didn't feel, it didn't feel like it was like there was any point to anything they were doing other than to not be at home on a Thursday night yeah. with their kids. No, 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 There's definitely a point to it. And here's the thing. My, my, my uncle is a Freemason, right? And I've met a bunch of them and they all say the same thing. If you line up a hundred people and they've never met any of them and the person, those hundred, however many in there are Freemasons, if they want the person to know that they're a Freemason, a Freemason can point them out without them saying anything. That's the crazy part about it. And so they've all said that they've gotten out of tickets, court cases, all sorts of stuff when it comes to business that they like network with each other. But then when I pressed my uncle on the details about it, he, he, he acts like he's a, a, a mime. He was like, I don't know. Huh? I don't, no, no, no. It's good. It's this, it's that. And I'm like, you didn't say anything. So anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> on to the next thing. Okay, so me and Ralph both watched the Tiger Woods documentary. 
on HBO. It's called Tiger. And it's part one and part two. Details everything from his childhood, growing up, how he, how his dad, everything from how his dad thought he was basically sent by God to change the world, that he was going to be like Mother Teresa and Jesus wrapped up in one. And then, and, and golf was going to do it. But all the way up to where he is now and how he's come back, he's won another major down from the from the depths. And I was taken aback because I had always been such a huge Tiger Woods fan. And I wasn't. Yeah, it, it was hard for me to watch because where I am on Tiger Woods now, Ralph, is I still like Tiger Woods in my in, in my heart, right? I like Tiger Woods. My issue with Tiger is, is that I know this is going to sound bad, but he's not black enough for me, dude. Like he never stands up for, for anybody but Tiger Woods. He's worried about him, his majors, nobody else. It's super lame. Like even Michael Jordan stands up and talks now or, or tries to help people, police and community re relations. Like do something, dude. Do something other than for Tiger Woods. So I came away from the documentary learning more about Tiger Woods f on some kind of level feeling sorry for Tiger Woods and then at the same time feeling grossed out by Tiger Woods. How about you, Ralph? Uh, <laughs> so two things. One, there's like an hour and 23 minutes in the first episode and there's two episodes. You call me, and I've probably got 20 minutes left in the first episode. And the first thing I say to you is, George, I don't think he authorized this. <laughs> and you're like, there's no way. As private as Tiger is, and as much as he likes his secrecy, there's not a <laughs> snowball's chance in hell that he authorized this. Yeah, because I was like, man, they, like they're really talking to his first girlfriend a lot. And then and then like his caddy, um Steve Williams. He, yeah, we had through, like through winning his first 14 majors or something like that. Um, and then a couple of his dad's friends from when they were kids uh, or when he was a kid. And uh, man, it was rough. And you knew it was going to be rough a few minutes in when every single time they'd show a video clip or a picture of his dad or even some B roll with his dad in it, they would play the most ominous, dark foreboding music so every time that, his dad was on screen and i was like what is this yeah. i was not ready i wish i had watched a preview i wish i had any information about what i was going into before yeah. i went into it because that i ended up finishing it that night and i have been bummed out for like a week yeah see here's the here's the thing is that with tiger's dad right so he knew that he had a prodigy on his hands. Like he knew it. He groomed him. He did the military uh, training on him the way he could be focused. And it's like that quote, I, a man's weaknesses flow from the same well as his strengths. So the things that have made Tiger Woods so great and be able to be so great at golf have hurt him personally. So his dad taught him all these things, but he didn't focus on his character. Like he thought Tiger was going to change the world and all that. And maybe he may have had he focused on his character as much as he focused on his golf game. And I, and, and I talk about that when I talk to kids and, and parents all the time, they're like, Oh, I want my kid to be a professional athlete. I'm like, focus on his character first, because if you don't, it is going to come back and bite you in the ass on the back end. And Tiger has literally cut off everybody out of his life. Like, it's just anybody who would say no to Tiger, he's cut them off or or like just and it's just like I understand now more how the things that happened to him happened to him because he pulled a Michael Jackson. He essentially insulated himself from the rest of the world, had a persona out there instead of living to be who who he is. Because people would have accepted him for who he is. It's just he was pretending and then that weight got too heavy, which partially I blame on his dad. But then it's like what Will Smith said. You are responsible. I'm sorry. You're not at 
at fault for what happened to you or what people taught you, but you are responsible to do something different and fix it. So I think the primary the the primary um, thing uh, with this documentary is this is a man uh, divided against himself. He had a goofy, fun loving, um, really outgoing personality, and then he had an inner drive to win, just win, and uh, and and he had the skill to go with it, and that's that's an incredibly rare uh, factor. And this entire time. For the whole two episodes, they're trying to paint Tiger Woods as somebody who has this great disdain for his desire to to win and compete and crush the competition um, and the fact that he has to hold who he really is back, that, that he's got this inner secret disdain that he tells Rachel Yucatel, uh and several of his other mistresses and that he tells – um, his wife that, and that he tell, told his first girlfriend that, and that he and that he had relayed some information like that to his caddy. But the truth is, he didn't hate. He did not hate the competitor. He hates the human. Yeah. And that's the thing that you learn from this documentary is T- Tiger Woods didn't actually have a disdain for what Tiger H- Woods was created to be. Tiger Woods had a disdain for the part of him that was still connected to the earth, the part of him that is physically fragile and can get injured, the part of him that has, that has a craving for human connection and vulnerability and that wants to have fun. He, at the end of the day, his dad is dead and he's left with this thing of this machine that his dad tried to create. And after his dad was gone, all of his energy from that point on went to making sure that the job got finished. Yep. Yeah. And, and that, that was my takeaway is that he doesn't hate, he doesn't hate what he was made to be. He hates that it didn't go far enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I don't think that, I don't know if he cares the fact that his relationships have been destroyed. I don't, I, I mean, I know that the documentary is, is going to, painted in a certain light, but I don't know if he does care or if, or if he's like, no, the goal is more important. But then I see him with his kids now. And we we just saw him playing with Charlie in that golf tournament. But now I'm like, I don't know what to believe because they show him and his dad. And it's like, he actually had disdain for what his dad was doing in terms of womanizing. But then he went and did the same thing which people can't understand. They're like, why would he do it if that's what he hated? You've seen it so many times in other people. They're like, I hate something in my parents and they go do it. They're like, I'm never going to be like that. But you don't, if you don't replace it with some other behavior, then that's what you're going to fall into. I got a friend, he's a college football coach and he always says more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. Period. So if he brought a if if uh, Earl Woods brought a Winnebago onto the golf course so that he could sleep around while his kid was right outside, knowing that he was sleeping around, cheating on his mom, who he loved, right? Like if if he did that for years around him, more is caught than taught. Then yeah. that becomes to you something that isn't just acceptable. But then when your dad's gone and you're looking for ways to connect with your dad, you end up repeating some of his behavior. Well, and that's not and, all he and did. He, didn't know how he to thought about joining the fame. Like yeah, he and didn't he, know how to he handle thought about it. trying to draw, join the military. Like yep. it, I, I took that in the same vein as he's looking for the hole that was left when first he cut his father out of his life. And then second, his dad passed away. So like he, he even talked about leaving golf altogether to like become a ranger or a seal a seal. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't. Yeah. And it's dude, it, it was like character matters, dude. You have to focus on it. And that that's what I try to do with my kids all the time, because I know the mistakes that I've made. And if I just push my kids to be great, great athletes, they will go, go do it. They are born on third base athletically. These kids are physical specimens and they will go do something fantastic. But if I don't focus on their character, they will make the same mistakes that I did. And my goal as a parent is not for them to make more money than I did or be more. I want them to be better, more successful people as a human being. 
Um, next up, though, somebody else is trying to redeem themselves as a successful human being. That's Dr. Burks. She worked with uh, on the coronavirus task force. She, you've seen her. And she went on a campaign today to rehab her image. And it wasn't too little too late for me, Ralph. But I was just like, like you in the moment that we needed you the most to speak up, you didn't. And the time to be bold and do the right thing is in the moment. Like I understand that she was under immense pressure not to quote unquote undermine Trump. But she messed up big time, allowed misinformation to go forward. Like, you really have to own this to move forward. And here is a clip from what she had to say today. Do you think President Trump appreciated the gravity of the health crisis you were describing? I think the president appreciated the gravity in March. Um, it took a while after I arrived in the White House to remove all of the ancillary data that was coming in. I mean, there was parallel data streams <laughs> coming into the White House that were not transparently utilized. And I needed to stop that. Where people you mean outside were, advisors? Outside advisors coming to inside advisors. And to this day, I mean, until the day I left, I am Pot, I'm convinced there were parallel data streams because I disinformation. I saw the president presenting graphs that I never made. So I know that someone or someone out there or someone inside was creating a parallel set of data and graphics that were shown to the president. I don't know to this day who, but I know what I sent up and I know that what was in his hands was different from that. Okay, so she sat in press conferences and she said that she didn't meet with the president after the spring, really. But you still sat in these press conferences and you sat there as like a symbol of what he was saying was okay. Like, what was your takeaway from her, her trying to rehab her image and kind of how this whole thing has gone with Dr. Burks? Okay, so I, I got to be super transparent here. I made a commitment when the whole, um, but basically when March 11th happened, Rudy Gobert, they ran out, stopped the jazz game. I told myself the best information that I'm going to get is going to be on the CDC website. And I refuse to watch the news. So any news that I got over the course of the, uh, the entire pandemic leading up to November 6th, which was the election. So we're talking almost eight months. I only read, and then obviously I had my Twitter timeline and I'd see people just bitching about Dr. Burks and then like hero worshiping Anthony Fauci um, just constantly. And so I, I never really understood the context of all of it because I made a commitment to read and only read. And so in trying to get up to speed after watching that interview this morning, um, I'll tell you this. One thing, the way that she's talking reminds me of somebody who like stops by to visit their parents to drop off meals on wheels or something like that once a day and they give them updates on the family and all that but their 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 ailing old aging parent also has some other weird gossip and ideas and they're trying to figure out like all right who's calling my dad and telling him all this weird information is it coming from facebook is it coming from twitter does he have a friend in the nursing home like where are they getting all this stuff because i have to correct different stuff yeah. every single day that was the way that she was talking about um about the president and that i can empathize with because it's your boss it's somebody who's in charge of the situation and you might believe that you're the best person for the job so you don't want to do anything to get thrown out on your ass because the person that might come in after you might be a yes person and cause even greater damage that part i can empathize with um the the other part of it is okay well this is actually people's lives uh and so the the more misinformation and the more conflicting information that was out there uh it it, it does nothing but cause harm in communities and uh had she fallen on her sword 
I mean, had she really just kamikaze pilot said, I can't do this anymore and resign. The one thing that we know about media is they don't mind a story that makes Trump look bad, right? Yes, they would have taken they would have invited she they would have invited her to be a commentator on CNN all day, every day. And she, she would have had a bigger the, platform. Yes. Yep. Given the good information, they would have invited her on Fox News. They would have had her on anywhere. The problem is, and even Dr. Fauci did it when, when he got up there and lied and said masks don't matter because, because uh, they didn't want there to be a, a scarcity and a run on PPE. That was 100% a mistake because now people go, go back and they say, remember when Dr. Fauci lied? And then they don't, and then they're like, well, Trump did the same thing as Anthony Fauci, all of this. But the issue is that when you're the leader of the free world, you can put pressure on other people as we have continued to see. And it's disheartening. Like, I, I don't think that people empathize with her enough in terms of how tough the situation was and how hard it was to say no to him or publicly, because you don't want to publicly embarrass the office of the president, all of this stuff. But at some point in time, when people's lives are at risk, don't you just have to be like, look, 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 man, I don't want you to throw me out because then the situation could get even worse. But like, I can't just sit up there and okay it where you had Dr. Fauci stand up there and do something completely different. He was like, yo, no, I wouldn't say that that's true. Like he would get up there and actually correct it. And I think Burks and, and part of it, I think, is because she was a woman, too. Not, not that she's not powerful or anything else like that, because he would refer to Dr. Fauci as Dr. Fauci and then refer to her as like Deborah or something. So it, so it was condescending even in that way. So I'm not even sure if she could have gone up to the podium and said that in front of the, the, the misogyny that stood in front of her. So I empathize yeah. with her there, but I'm like, you had to do something, right? Yeah, and I would say probably the most frustrating thing that came out of today is just the idea that she didn't meet with the president for months. It would be like the bride not meeting with a wedding planner for seven months before the wedding, and uh, it would basically reveal that the wedding isn't actually important to you. When it should be the most important thing to you, it should be you're the bride, right? Yeah. Donald Trump is the president and and the the health and safety of the American people should always be a, a the leader of the executive branch's number one priority. I don't elect a president for the economy. I don't elect a president for their um, social positions for the most part. The number one thing that I think about when it comes to a president is how are they as an ambassador and will they keep us safe if it comes down to it? Because they are actually the ones that have the authority to um, the, the authorization of military force that doesn't even need like congressional approval and, and all that sorts of stuff. Um, you know, I, that's the type of thing that I care about. When I hear that there's a deadly pandemic going on and that the president isn't meeting directly with the people that, that he's tasked with spreading the message of keeping everybody safe, uh, that's very confusing for me. Um, I 100% agree with you. Uh, final thing for today, Ralph, is <laughs> which is because cause you wanted to talk about about this. So which was the best meme of this week? Is it the. Is it the Bernie Sanders memes where they have turned him into everything under the sun? Or is it the Conor McGregor sleep on the canvas memes? Uh, well, the, I, I enjoy the Bernie one because it's the first time that I've seen 98% of the people in my life all laughing at the same thing. Um, that's cool. Whether they're conservative, whether they're like deep, deep embedded in Trumpism, whether they've even dabbled in QAnon, whether they're liberal to the point of, you know, wanting to tear down the establishment or whether they're neoliberal and high fiving them, everybody around them about Joe Biden. Everyone thinks that the, that the Bernie Sanders thing is funny. I think it's funny. 
Um, the Conor McGregor one, the Conor McGregor one is more just funny to me uh, because I'm surrounded by Conor McGregor sycophants who, who I think simple minded people follow loud voices. Conor McGregor is an incredible fighter. He's lost four of his last seven professional fights. And um, I, w- I watched when Nate Diaz choked him out and he had tears streaming down his eyes. And, uh, and, uh, and when uh, Khabib did the same thing to him and when Floyd made him look silly um, doing what Floyd does, yeah. dancing around the ring. I keep watching this man lose, and I keep seeing his super fan. Every time you say anything he's bad Oscar about him. He's Oscar De La Hoya, dude. He is it's good. He's Oscar De La Hoya. One early, became a crowd favorite, made a lot of noise. And the other thing about Conor McGregor is this. Mike Tyson said it. Once you make over $100 million, it's hard to get motivated to get in that ring, to get punched in the face. The same, like, you don't have that same willingness to die for this because – the best boxers, boxing is one of the only sports where the best people are born out of like the best fighters are born out of not just adversity, but literally having no other options. Like that's what boxing is. And Conor McGregor has other options by his actions. He's been arrested multiple times. He's started tequila. Com- I'm sorry, Irish whiskey companies. He's doing so many things. He's got his hands in so many ways. Just like um, Manny Pacquiao. He's a senator. He's trying to be a boxer, trying to be a humanitarian. A All this he's stuff. A, he's a, he does concerts. I love yeah, Manny. Yes. It, it changes you. I mean, Floyd is really only, one of the only people who's made so much money and is still focused. I mean, because he doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't. He has other trappings, but he's focused on the work. I mean, and- yeah, I don't see I I don't feel like MMA and boxing are the same. I feel like Conor McGregor is still elite of the elite. I feel like he still wants to fight. He'll fight an old man at the bar for absolutely no reason. He'll try to throw a chair through a van window in a Vegas park. Jake Paul. Right. So so here, here's my thing. MMA doesn't work the way that boxing does. MMA is more like the NFL where you could go nine and seven and still be a champion. If everything works itself, you're going to lose sometimes only Khabib doesn't because matchups and styles are different. Uh, Training regiments are different. John Bones Jones, John Bones Jones, John Bones Jones. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, so there, there are examples of people. So that, and then, then that reinforces my point. Conor McGregor does not belong in the goat conversation. He's just very good. But every time you bring this up, Conor McGregor super fans always tweet that "Who the fuck is this guy?" thing at, at, at you. And so I always have to to keep my mouth shut because those people are super annoying. I'm not going to yep. keep my mouth shut anymore. He's three and four in his last seven professional fights. He does not belong in that conversation. Dude, he is what Ronda Rousey was. People got upset with me when Ronda Rousey was at the top and people were like, oh, she should fly for Floyd. I was like, listen, she at that point in time, I was like, listen, she's 11 fights old, like in, in a new division with women that had not as many have been fighting. And as soon as more women got to fighting, she lost and lost badly and was never the, the uh, same. There's something about fighting when you get knocked out the first time, it changes your entire life because now that air of I can't get knocked out, it goes away. And now we'll see because this is the first time he's ever been knocked out. Yep. Um, and guys, thank you guys for listening though to Am I Right Sir or Am I Wrong with, of course, my main man Ralph Ams. And hopefully you got a good taste of who he is. And you guys, make sure that you guys share the feed, tell a friend about the podcast, all of that. Make sure that you share and peace out. Catch you guys next episode. Oh, also, Ralph will be gone for the next two episodes because he is going on a uh, an excursion because he wants to go hang out with his wife. Well, you make it sound so weird. I I have uh, only left the house uh, to not just go to the grocery store, probably or or to cover a, a sporting event, probably five to six times in the last year. Uh, and this, this is going to be the first uh, couple of days uh, without my kids in a really long time. So I, I am excited right, well, well, uh, to don't save my with relationship another. with my family. Oh, no, no, <laughs> nope. All right, nope. peace out. <laughs>